Okay, good morning everybody. And thank you all for being with us today, in person or online. On behalf of the two research units that joined force today to organize this event, the Chair on Legal Culture and the Institute of European and Comparative Private Law of the University of Girona. We are very proud and pleased to introduce Matt Hasler, PhD fellow at the Cambridge Family Law Center. Matt studied philosophy at Oxford and then received legal practice training. He has been practicing as solicitor in England and Wales for almost six years, specializing in divorce, financial remedies for relationship breakdown, proceedings under the Children Act and domestic abuse. Matt also pursued then the LLM in jurisprudence at Cambridge winning several prizes for his performance, and is now undergoing doctoral studies on normative foundations of family law. I encountered Matt in Cambridge last summer, and I immediately realized that we share many interests regarding the theory and the practice of family law and policy. In addition to this amazing coincidence, I was also impressed by the strength of his philosophical background provides to his policy views. As most of you know, more than 10 years ago, the Spanish Constitutional Court held that the act on a stable de facto unions of Navarre was unconstitutional. The court argued that any legal, any legal entitlement not grounded on both parties' prior and formal agreement was contrary to the right to the free development of personality enshrined in Article 10 of the Spanish Constitution. For more than 10 years now, courts in Catalonia have resisted the temptation to challenge substantially equivalent provisions of the Catalan Civil Code. Our government has not pursued the amendment of these rules either. One is allowed to think that both courts and government consider that the default rules applicable to cohabitants are consistent with the views held by the Catalan society as a whole regarding what is a fair result for committed relationships after the breakup or the death of one of the parties. For more than 15 years now, interstate succession rights conferred on the surviving partner have been enforced without raising criticism, let alone a role among legal actors. And yet, arguing that allegedly his son did not want either to marry or to formalize any, any kind of union, the mother of a man deceased in 2019 claimed preference over his son's estate against his five-year unmarried partner. She asked the Provincial Court of Barcelona to challenge the cohabitants in the state rights laid down in the Catalan Civil Code. And the Provincial Court of Barcelona did so on September the 6th, 2023, and we are now awaiting the Constitutional Court's judgment. We now therefore need powerful views that stand up against unsubstantiated claims such as those held by the Spanish Constitutional Court, which I dare to qualify as theoretically underdeveloped and empirically flawed. Let us therefore listen to what Matt is willing to explain about how to justify the legal regulation of personal relationships. And therefore, welcome, Matt. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you for the invitation to come and speak. And thank you to everyone for coming, uh, whether in person or online. And if you have read the paper that was circulated in advance, thank you for working through it. I appreciate it, it was quite long. Um, so what I'm going to do is present the key argument of that paper and really the sort of fruits of the first portion of my PhD research. Um, now these ideas are developing, very much work in progress, so I'd be very interested to hear comments, criticisms uh, afterwards. Um, 
But let me begin by kind of introducing the key theme of my overall research project. So the phenomenon in which I'm interested is one which I call the grounding of legal entitlements in personal relationships. By this I simply mean any situation in which a person's legal position alters by virtue of their participation in a personal relationship of one kind or other. Now in family law, we are most familiar with this in the case of marital relationships and parent-child relationships. So under the law of England and Wales and of many other jurisdictions, by virtue of the fact that I am married to my wife, I have a certain set of legal entitlements. Um, I have certain entitlements against the state, perhaps for special tax advantages. Uh, notably, if we were to divorce, we would have claim rights against one another for financial assistance. And again, these entitlements, they're grounded in the marital relationship. They come with the marital relationship. Similarly, parent-child relationships involve entitlements against the state, perhaps for subsidised childcare, against the co-parent, perhaps for child support. And they involve a very important set of entitlements which we hold in respect of our children. So we are legally empowered to make certain decisions on their behalf. And we may also have entitlements against third parties, perhaps for parental leave from our employer. Again, all these entitlements, I say, are grounded in the parental relationship. But of course, other personal relationships are available. The key example we just, you just raised, of de facto relationships, cohabiting relationships, can be treated as grounds for legal entitlements, but sometimes are not. Caring relationships, perhaps of an uh, older child taking care of an older parent, uh, could also be treated as a ground for a special set of entitlements. And in practice, although, in, sorry, in theory, but relatively rarely in practice, even friendships could be treated as grounds for special entitlements. So this kind of raises two general normative questions. Which kinds of personal relationships can legitimately be treated as grounds for entitlements? And secondly, what should the content of those schemes of entitlements be? Um, and these kind of fall under an umbrella question, which is the one I'm really interested in, which is this. What justifies the grounding of legal entitlements in personal relationships? Why should my personal relationships ever make a difference to my legal position? And that's the sort of fundamental normative question in which I'm interested. And as I say, I think that question underpins a huge amount of normative debates in family law. And the example of the treatment of de facto relationships is one example. The question of should these relationships be treated as grounds for special entitlements, and if so, what should those entitlements be? Now, I am in the paper and in the presentation, I'm trying to pull back from the details of those specific debates to address this question in quite an abstract way. And my reasoning for doing so is because within these particular debates, different rationales are offered for why we should or shouldn't recognise a relationship, what specific entitlements should be attached to it. And in order to moderate those debates, I feel we need a kind of more overarching sense of, well, what should the law be doing at all when it engages with personal relationships? So my ambitious project is to attempt to answer that question in an abstract way and to answer what I call the general demand for justification, for justifying this particular practice which seems characteristic of family law. So if we're going to answer that question, we need to begin with thinking about how are we going to do so. So there's a variety of different responses to this question, and we need to be able to have some criteria by which to measure those responses and distinguish good responses from bad ones. And the way I do this in the paper is I set out kind of two general objections which we might make to the grounding of any entitlements in personal relationships. And I say, if we want to uh, create an acceptable response to this general demand, we need to be able to answer these two objections. So the first objection I refer to as the equality objection. So here we have three people, A, B, and C, and we can assume that A and B are in some sort of personal relationship. Now, at the moment, we don't, it doesn't matter what relationship it is, but the state wants to treat that relationship as the ground for a special entitlement. So let's say it confers a claim right on B, which she holds against A, and A has the legal duty which correlates to that claim right. Now, the equality objection is voiced by C. C is an outsider to these personal relationships. And she says, well, this claim right is beneficial to B. It gives her a special benefit, um, which is withheld from C, because C doesn't participate in these kinds of relationships. So the equality objection says, 
What's the justification for that differential treatment? How can we justify the state treating these two people differently? We need to have a morally substantial reason for doing so. So any response to the general demand must be able to answer that objection. The second objection is the autonomy objection. So whereas the equality objection is voiced by C, the outsider, the autonomy objection is voiced by A, the insider. Because this claim right, although it's beneficial to B, it's burdensome to A. So let's suppose the claim right requires A to pay some money, financial assistance perhaps, to B. So that's burdensome to him. And the way it's burdensome for him is it's requiring him to give up some of his resources which he would have put to another use. Okay? And so that's interfering with his ability to live his own sort of life plan. And so I say that's interfering with his autonomy. It's interfering with his ability to develop and pursue his own conception of the good, his own plan of life. Now, the mere fact that we're interfering with his autonomy doesn't mean that it's unacceptable, but it does mean we need to have a substantive basis for doing so. So I start from the assumption that we do have to give due respect to people's ability to pursue their own life plans. So any response to the general demand is going to need to answer the autonomy objection. And so this generates two general constraints on acceptable responses to this general demand for justification. The equality constraint, which says the state must always act in a way that's consistent with the equal moral status of persons. And the autonomy constraint, which says that the state must not interfere unduly with any person's ability to form and pursue their own conception of the good. Now, these concepts, and particularly the concept of autonomy, are controversial in family law. And there's a great deal of scholarship which says actually an individual conception of autonomy is inconsistent with the nature of family life, the nature of personal relationships. And often the concept of autonomy is actually used to block regulation of personal relationships of family life. It's cited as a reason for the state to withhold from regulating. Um, and for that, that's part of the reason for the scepticism about autonomy, I think, in family law circles. Now, the argument I'm trying to develop is one that says we should have a strong commitment to the value of individual autonomy, but we should also see that that, in fact, justifies a certain scheme of regulation for personal relationships. So that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> so how do I do that? Well, in the paper, I consider a variety of different responses to this so-called general demand for justification, and I measure them against these two constraints. The last of these will be my response, but the, the first three are, are responses I take from elsewhere in the literature. So the first of these I call the protective response, which says the state is justified in imposing these special schemes of regulation for the purpose of protecting participants in personal relationships against certain forms of abusive behaviour. So the idea behind this response is that all people, by virtue of our common humanity, have basic moral duties to treat one another with respect. If I walk out of the building here and come across a stranger in the street, I have both a moral and a legal duty to refrain from physically assaulting that person. And that's because I owe that person basic duties of respect. And so one of the reasons we have systems of criminal law and tort law is to hold everyone to these basic duties of decent treatment. And so if we go back to our example, the state may impose criminal law obligations on everyone to hold them to these basic standards of treatment. Now the protective response builds on that thought and says, well, in certain kinds of personal relationships, particularly relationships of intimacy, people have new opportunities for treating people in a way that violate these basic duties of respect. And this is most clear in cases of domestic abuse and domestic violence. The, the pattern of the relationship creates a unique uh, circumstance in which people can treat each other badly. And it's difficult to regulate that by appeal to the general criminal law. We need tailored regulation to deal with the circumstances of intimate relationships. And so that provides a justification for conferring special legal entitlements that are grounded in those intimate relationships. And this is absolutely fine. This doesn't conflict with the equality or the autonomy constraints, because C is an outsider to these relationships, so she doesn't require these additional protections. And Although, in a sense, these additional protections are burdensome on the participants of these relationships, all they're requiring them to do is keep to the standards of um, the, the basic moral duties that they ought to owe to all other people. So these entitlements aren't conferring additional benefits or burdens on people because of their participation in these relationships. 
It's just requiring that they abide by the basic standards which everyone owes to everyone else. So the protective response is absolutely fine and as it should be. The problem with it is it only gets us so far because in family law, much of the time when we're conferring these special benefits and burdens through family law, we are conferring genuinely additional burdens and genuinely additional benefits on people. So if I separate from my wife and I'm required to part with a lot of my resources in financial assistance for her, that's a special duty that I'm being asked uh, to hold towards her. I don't owe that duty to the world at large. I owe that duty specifically to her. Similarly, we ask parents to sacrifice a great deal of time, resources and energy to raise their children. Those are additional burdens that the state is posing by imposing these legal duties on parents, for example. So if we want to justify those additional benefits and burdens, we need to go beyond this protective response. So we might therefore turn to the second response, which I call the perfectionist response. And this, I would suggest, is perhaps maybe a more old-fashioned way of doing family law. I mean, I'm sure many places still do it now, but certainly in England and Wales, this kind of approach, I would say, was the foundation of a lot of English family law for a long time. The idea here is that there are certain kinds of personal relationships, certain ways of conducting personal relationships that are inherently good, and there are others that are inherently bad. So, classically, the idea would be marital relationships have a privileged status, and non-marital relationships have a lesser status, and in some cases are considered morally, uh, they should be morally prohibited, for example. So the perfectionist response will say, we can justify conferring this special claim right on B, and conferring this special benefit on her, and the special burden on A, because firstly, we think there's a particular way personal relationships should be conducted if they are to conform to these general moral principles um, this, this moral code or perhaps a religious code of how relationships should be conducted and so that's we, we favour B because she participates in the valuable relationship and we place the burden on A because we want him to conduct his relationship in the way we think our moral code requires now the problem with this is that it's invoking a potentially controversial either religious or moral code um, in, in, the, in the phrase I use in the paper, it's a code that is reasonably contestable. So in a pluralistic society, we allow there can be reasonable disagreements about these kind of comprehensive moral and religious codes. So if we abide by that view, the idea there can be reasonable disagreement, then the perfectionist response falls foul of the autonomy constraint. So the autonomy constraint says, people should be free to develop and pursue their own conceptions of the good, provided those conceptions of the good are reasonable provided they're consistent with the equal status of other people, for example. And so if we allow that, then the state should not be using its coercive powers to enforce one conception of the good on everyone. And this is the idea of kind of principle of liberal neutrality, which comes from John Rawls. So if we abide by that, then the perfectionist response is unacceptable. We need a response that is neutral between these conceptions of the good. So we might therefore move on to what I call the consequentialist response. And in the paper, I argue that this is perhaps a kind of more modern response we often find in family law scholarship. The idea is it distinguishes itself from the perfectionist response by trying to identify ends that the state may pursue consistent with this requirement of neutrality. So we say any reasonable conception of the good must recognise that certain ends are legitimate for the state to pursue. So one of these may be the alleviation of financial deprivation. Another one may be the alleviation of gender inequality. These are legitimate ends for the state to pursue on any reasonable conception of the good. At least that's what I would claim. And the consequentialist response says, by identifying those legitimate ends, we can then use our schemes of regulation of personal relationships to better pursue those ends. We use our personal legal entitlements, as I call them, as means to the pursuit of those ends. So, consider again our example. Let's suppose that we've done some research and we found that relationships of the kind in which A and B participate tend to leave one person in a position of financial disadvantage when they end. So let's say that in this case, people in B's position, the, the financially more vulnerable person, will tend to suffer some disadvantage when the relationship ends. And so the state says, well, we can tackle that problem by requiring the wealthier person to part with some of their resources and give them to the financially vulnerable person. So therefore we're using this claim right, this blue arrow, this claim right, as a, as a means for, attack, um, for addressing that particular state of affairs. 
Now, the potential problem with the consequentialist response is not that we have an objection to the ends that the state is pursuing, because we are just assuming for the sake of argument those ends are legitimate. The problem comes as to whether this is an appropriate means to pursue those ends. So consider this from the point of view of A. Let's imagine that A and B have had a relationship in which they have been financially independent of one another. They've purposely arranged their affairs to be financially independent. They have no joint caring responsibilities. So they have very much engaged in an independent relationship. Nevertheless, perhaps because A is the higher earner, B does suffer some detriment when the relationship ends. They have to set up two separate households. A is more able to do that because he's the higher earner. And so B does suffer a detriment. Now, A may say, we do, of course, as a society, have a collective social responsibility to respond to situations of financial deprivation. And A will say, I have to do my part as a member of the society to fulfil that collective obligation, perhaps by paying taxes and funding a social safety net. But what he would object to is the idea that he has a special burden, a special duty to specifically meet B's needs. He may say, the way we have conducted our relationship is one in which I haven't taken on that responsibility and it's unfair to hold me to it. From C's point of view as the outsider to the relationship, she may say, well, I, I also suffer from financial disadvantage. But because I'm not a participant in one of these relationships, I don't have this special beneficial entitlement. So she may say, you're treating me less favourably than B, but you're not showing that B deserves to have that more favourable treatment. You're just showing it tends to promote the state's ends to confer these entitlements. So the problem with the consequentialist response is the state isn't even attempting to show that the beneficiaries of the claim rights deserve to have those entitlements, nor that the people who suffer the burdens of the correlating duties deserve to suffer those burdens. And for that reason I say it treats people morally arbitrarily, it treats people as means to the ends of the state, it instrumentalises them and therefore fails to pay due respect to individual autonomy or to the requirement to treat people equally unless there is a non-arbitrary reason for treating them differently. So the first part of the paper, I kind of come to this point. I see none of them are happy. So I, I, I come to this point at the end of the paper, which might seem to justify only a very minimal level of regulation of personal relationships. And in fact, when I presented earlier versions of this paper in the past where I only got to this point, a lot of people thought I was advocating for an entirely laissez-faire approach to personal relationships. And this is the sort of approach we often see when people commit themselves strongly to the value of autonomy. They think, well, basically the state should stay out of it, let people arrange it themselves. And perhaps if they choose to marry, if they choose to enter into a contract, that's different. But otherwise the state should stay out of it. Now that's not where I'm going to end things. This is just an intermediate point. So the conclusion I draw from the argument so far is that if we are going to develop a successful response to the general demand consistent with the equality and autonomy constraints, then it must meet three requirements. First, it needs to justify the conferral of genuinely additional benefits and burdens. So this was the protective response didn't do this, and this is why we <coughs> needed more. It must show that those benefits and burdens are deserved by their recipients. Now, the problem with the consequentialist response is it didn't show that the beneficiary of the claim right genuinely had a moral entitlement to it, nor that the uh, person who bore the uh, duty genuinely deserved to bear that duty. So we need to do this. Third, we need to do this without presupposing the truth of a reasonably contestable conception of the good, without presupposing a controversial religious or ethical code in a way which violates the duty of neutrality. So... These are the requirements that we have to meet if we're going to develop an acceptable and complete response to this general demand for justification. Now, if we can't meet those requirements, then we have to adopt this minimal regulation. But I think we can meet these requirements in a way that's consistent with the constraints. So, this is my argument. And I've got an asterisk here, so this, this is strongly uh, inspired by work by Elizabeth Brake and Chiara Cordelli, who are two kind of political philosophers working in the liberal field. So in the paper, I kind of emphasise the bits I take from them and so on, but I wanted to include that acknowledgement because um, I think a lot of what I'm doing is trying to apply a lot of their insights to this more specific legal question. Um, so it kind of has three stages, my response. The first one is that in order to live a fully autonomous life, people need certain primary goods. And I'll explain on the next slide exactly what I mean by that. Second, that personal relationships are sources of primary goods. They're strongly conducive to the realisation of these goods and in some cases unnecessary for them. 
And thirdly, the state will jeopardise the production of primary goods unless it treats personal relationships as grounds for legal entitlements. So unless the state protects people's ability to participate in these relationships, it will jeopardise those relationships as sources of primary goods and it will place unreasonable burdens on people who participate in those relationships. So let me break that down step by step and explain my thinking. So firstly, what are primary goods? So this is a concept that comes from John Rawls, I'm sure many people will be familiar with. So Rawls introduces the concept of a primary good, and he talks about it as an all-purpose resource, an all-purpose means. The idea being that whatever I want to do with my life, whatever my plan of life is, whatever my conception of the good is, it will benefit me to have more of these goods than less. And if I don't have a sufficient amount or quantity of these goods, then I will be hindered in pursuing my plan of life. And so Rawls gives a list of primary goods, and I have four of them up on the screen. We have health, wealth or income, uh, self-esteem, self-respect, and then intelligence. And the idea being that, yeah, whatever I want to do in my life, it will benefit me to have more of these than less. Now, I say that personal relationships, particularly close personal relationships, and I'll explain a bit what I mean by that, are important sources of primary goods. And so in the paper, I focus on four categories of primary goods. There could be others, but these are the ones I focus on in the paper. Firstly, health. Secondly, self-respect. Thirdly, what I call psycho-emotional adjustment. And thirdly, reasonable trust, which very much comes from Cordelli's research. Now, I won't go through all of these in, in great detail, because if you've read the paper, you'll see how I handle these. But the basic idea, idea is drawing on research in kind of psychology, child development, moral philosophy. There's evidence and there's reason to believe that participations in the right kinds of personal relationships are important for the realisation of these goods. So I'll, I'll focus on self-respect because Rule says that's the most important primary good. So self-respect is a complex good. It involves basic respect for oneself as a moral agent, deserving of these basically deep, decent treatment. It also involves a concept of self-esteem, of believing oneself to have value and one's projects to be worth pursuing. And also involves a, a sense of self-confidence, the belief that one has the ability to pursue one's goals. Uh, and in the paper I talk a bit about how self-confidence can also include a sense of emotional security, the belief that one can try to do things and strive to do things and isn't necessarily going to fall apart if one fails to do so. So self-respect is a complex good. But there's studies in uh, child development, for example, showing that children are much more likely to develop a strong and robust sense of self-respect if they have the right kind of close personal relationship with a carer. So often that will be a, a parent, but it could be any figure that, in attachment theory, John Bowlby's attachment theory would say is a kind of secure base, an attachment figure. A person for whom that child can use as an anchor to go out and explore the world with safety that they will come back and always be valued and always be loved for who they are. And similarly, these sorts of relationships can be important to adults as well. I mean, many adults have close, personal, intimate relationships with other people, and a factor of that intimacy is a sense of genuine self-disclosure of oneself to another, and for being valued for the person that one is. And this can be very important to a sense of a person's self-respect and self-esteem. If I know that another person knows me very intimately, and that they still value me and are still affectionate to me in spite of knowing everything about me, that suggests that there is something I can value in myself. So the idea being that for many people, not necessarily for everyone, but for many people, participation in the right kinds of personal relationships is very important for the realisation of these goods. Um, and similar points I could make about health and the, these other goods, um, but I'll leave those in the paper if people want to read. So the conclusion of this section is, these goods are more likely to be available within and sometimes impossible to secure without the right kinds of close personal relationships. Now there's a concept which I take from Milton Reagan, the family scholar Milton Reagan. Um, he talks about in these kinds of relationships, people manifest what is called an expanded sense of self. So, for example, in my relationship with my son, I don't see him as an entirely separate entity for me. His interests are not entirely separate from my own. If my son is having a problem, I experience that very much in the same way as if I am having a problem. If my wife is struggling with something, that's a problem for me, not just for her. 
Um, and so when we have this expanded sense of self, we respond to other people's needs very much as if they were our own. We identify with other people very much as if those people are aspects of ourselves. We, we experience a merging of self and other. And when we do that, we, we kind of drop this kind of protective distance which we have from other people. We don't see each other as fully individual. And so my argument is that it's those kinds of relationships that are most conducive to the realisation of these goods. And a state that is interested in autonomy <coughs> must therefore protect people's ability to conduct those kinds of relationships. Now, a state that fails to confer appropriate schemes of legal entitlements, personal legal entitlements, I say will intrude on those kinds of relationships in a way that jeopardises them and imposes unreasonable burdens on their participants. And so this is why I say, by starting from the concept of autonomy, we therefore justify legal regulation of these relationships. So in the paper I give two examples. These are just two illustrations. Other illustrations could be given. The details of these illustrations we could argue about. But my point is to show we can find a way of justifying specific regulations of personal relationships. So the first is called the cross-border relationship. I won't talk about that here because the second is more appropriate, I think, for this issue about de facto relationships. So I imagine an example, the communal couple, I call them. So let's say A and B, they are in a close personal relationship in which they both manifest this kind of expanded sense of self. And because of that, they care for one another's interests in a sense as if they were their own. So we can imagine a situation, a very common situation, where one person perhaps is the higher earner, uh, is perhaps more career focused. And in order to pursue the career, uh, he moves to different parts of the country. Now, his partner, she is very happy to move with him. Perhaps she's not so career-focused herself, um, and so she will travel around the country with him. And so we have this kind of classic dynamic of the kind of breadwinner and then there's a person supporting the breadwinner. Um, now, when they're doing that, because they participate in one of these close relationships, they're not negotiating every single thing they do. They're not setting up contractual... They're not saying, I'll move with you to support your job if you do this for me. Because this is a communal relationship. It's not an exchange relationship. It's not a commercial relationship. And so because of that, they both act in ways that, are, from an individual point of view, involve sacrifice, involve disadvantage. But while the relationship is continuing, that is entirely as it should be, because this is a close relationship. If they conducted their relationship as a more commercial exchange, their individual interests might be more prote protected, but their ability of this relationship to realise these goods for them would be jeopardised. So it's important they conduct their relationship in this way. Of course, when the relationship ends, that creates a, uh, an unequal division of benefits and burdens. So because this man has pursued his career, he has acquired wealth and earning capacity, which will survive after the termination of the relationship. Because his supportive partner has sacrificed many of her own career prospects in order to do this, she is left with the burdens, uh, disadvantages of this relationship. Now I say in this situation, firstly, he has a moral obligation to share some of his resources to provide financial assistance to his partner. And the reason for that is he has been able to enjoy the goods that that relationship have provided only because of the stance she has taken in that relationship. Because they have participated in this communal relationship, where they have not been focused on protecting each other as individuals, but as forming a unit, it has led to this unequal division of financial advantages. So for him to retain all of those for himself in the relationship's ends would be morally unacceptable. And in saying that, I appeal to a basic principle of fairness, of fair play. This isn't a principle I invoke from some kind of religious code or, I would say, controversial moral code. This is a principle of fairness and basic justice, which should be recognised on any reasonable understanding of the good. And so for that reason, we say he can be held to that moral duty. Now, if the state fails to provide a way for her to enforce that duty against him, then the state is complicit in his unfair treatment of her. Because he is in a position to do that, because he has a set of property entitlements that the state has conferred on him and that are uh, rendered enforceable by the coercive power of law. He is able to treat her unfairly because of his entitlements, which are themselves the creation of the legal system. So for that reason, the state owes it to her to provide her with a remedy against him. 
and there's no undue interference with his autonomy if he's required to satisfy that remedy, because he's only being held to a moral duty that he has acquired by virtue of the way they've conducted the relationship. And so there's my way, my attempt at least, to square an attachment to autonomy with this kind of regulation of relationships, which could include de facto relationships. The idea being that unless the state confers these sets of entitlements, then it will impose an unfair burden on people who conduct their relationships in this close personal way. And the state should have an interest in ensuring people can do this because these relationships are themselves conducive of goods which are necessary for autonomous lives. So that's the argument in a nutshell. Um, now, I will leave it there. I could talk for longer. Um, and there's lots in the paper I haven't touched on here. Um, so if people have questions, um, then we can talk about that in the Q&A. But um, that's where I'll leave it for now. So thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you very much, Matt, for this uh, presentation in which you provide us with this, uh, I would say, this sort of microscopic view of the, uh, of the basics uh, in the um, conduct that we must uh, uh, interact among themselves and which provides this starting point for the discussion of the uh, uh, elements I would say that this constraint of autonomy that you mentioned is the, the, the most important. Mm. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask whether some people in, in online want to raise some questions, uh, to, to place some comment. Otherwise, I will give the floor to the, some people in the, in the room. I don't know, Diego, whether you want to intervene. Yes? Okay, go ahead then. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the presentation. I just, I, I have one question regarding uh, the way in which uh, relationships, personal relationships, uh, you claim that there are sources of primary goods. I, I tend to agree with what you say, um, especially, but, but I have some doubts regarding, for example, health as a primary good. The fact that a personal relationship is a source of health in a way, uh, doesn't make it a unique source of it. So, uh, in which way personal relations or, or recognizing further obligations to, to people involved in personal relationships promotes health? How can that be justified if there are many other ways in which health can be achieved? And the second concern I have is with self-respect and, and reasonable trust, for example. Um, I don't know whether the model ends up being, in a way, perfectionist, because we know that there's some people do not develop deep personal relationships. I'm sure that it's impossible to live in, <laughs> to live in this kind of world without developing any kind of personal relationship. But it, it is certainly a matter of degree uh, how much involvement you have with other people. Some people decide to live alone and not have, not have, uh, not have uh, children. Uh, of course, they have parents, but they may, they, might in the, uh, may, they may have or decide to leave home very early, not to have a strong attachment with them. And in a way, they wouldn't be able to uh, enjoy these primary goods. And I'm not sure about it. I, I think that the, the perfectionist, uh, there is some perfectionist aspect there. Um, and, and, and I don't know, it's also a source of discomfort because uh, especially with self-respect and self-esteem, why do you need others to have self-esteem or, or, or self-respect, right? To be, to be, to, to think of yourself viable and to, to be, uh, like a person worth being respected and, and owning or, or pursuing the kind of life of this world being pursued. So this is the kind of thoughts that, that, that you're talking about. I, I have to say that I think it's a great kind of, a great line of research, the one you are undertaking, 
It's very interesting and it motivates me a lot to read more about it. So thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you for those questions. Um, so the first one specifically about the issue of health. So yes, you're right. Of course, there are lots of ways of promoting health and protecting health. Um, I suppose this would come down to a question of whether there are for, not necessarily for everyone, but for many people, uh, a lack of uh, sufficiently, the right kinds of personal relationships can be a specific source of ill health. And so there is some research um, suggesting, for example, that loneliness should be recognised as a freestanding health condition. So that, it, that it, it comes with specific forms of harm, it promotes specific forms of harm and ill health, that even if we can promote people's health in other ways, even if we can give tablets and, and, and things like that, we cannot fully address the, the consequences for ill health of a person's fundamental loneliness. So if that's the case, then of course there are other remedies we can provide, but if it's the case that we can't tackle some of these sources of ill health um, out, unless people have these relationships, then that would still, I, I would suggest that still provides a ground for uh, seeing personal relationships as one source of important source of health that isn't necessarily replaceable by other kinds of interventions. Now, obviously, that's an empirical claim dependent on empirical research. Um, so, if the empirical data doesn't stack up, then that part of my argument certainly falls down. So, um, yeah, it depends on this idea that there's a particular source of ill health which has its source in a lack of these particular kinds of relationships. Um, now, that, that point sort of feeds into the second point you're making, because I certainly wouldn't want to suggest that unless a person has the right kind of close personal relationships, they are inevitably going to get sick or whatever. Um, similarly, I wouldn't want to claim that inevitably they're unable to trust others or they are unable to develop a, a sense of self-respect. And I have these discussions quite a lot with uh, my supervisor, Matthew Kramer, who's Matthew Kramer, who, for those who don't know, is a political and legal philosopher. Now, he describes himself as leading a determinately solitary life. Um, he is very much committed to his work. Um, almost, I would say, in the style of almost like a secular monk, okay? So he lives in college and this is his work and he very much sees himself in that way. So it's interesting that I'm writing this sort of research under his supervision. And so he frequently challenges me on exactly these kinds of issues you have raised, where he says, well, my life isn't one in which I pursue close personal relationships. Are you saying, therefore, I can't have a warranted sense of self-respect? My answer to that is absolutely not. I, I'm not claiming that a person cannot have a warranted sense of self-respect or self-esteem in the absence of these relationships. My claim is that for many people, a substantial number of people, it is difficult to uh, have a warranted sense of self-respect or self-esteem in the absence of these relationships. Um, so in the paper I talk about the, an, an example, an objection which come, Elizabeth Brake considers, the, she calls the hermit objection. Can we imagine a religious hermit who you know, develops a conception of the good in this way and, uh, and therefore doesn't pursue these close personal relationships. Now, I certainly don't want to suggest that a hermit cannot have a reasonable conception of the good. I don't want to rule that out as impossible. But I want to argue that even for a hermit, in the paper I say, even for a hermit, um, having the ability to have, for example, social skills is of use to a hermit because it allows him or her, as she's developing her plan of life, to have legitimate alternatives available. Um, a person who has absolutely no social skills may be cripplingly terrified of interaction with others and therefore not even consider those as realistic conceptions <coughs> of the good. So I say that these skills are often of use to people who pursue solitary lifestyles. Um, and I think some of these arguments are particularly strong in the case of children. So I think certainly when we get to adulthood, many adults do live solitary lifestyles and are entirely happy in doing so. I would still argue that for very many adults it's difficult to realise these goods without close relationships. But for children it seems particularly clear that without the right kinds of personal relationships, particularly with carers, it's very, very difficult for them to develop these, uh, these goods of self-esteem um, and, and, and to be able to trust others and to actually have the capacity to trust others. So, um, yeah, I, I, I certainly acknowledge the, the concern you're making. I certainly don't want to commit myself to ruling out solitary lifestyles as, as sort of illegitimate or of less value. But I think I can nevertheless say that because of the way most human beings are, for most human beings, in order to realise these goods, we do need to protect these kinds of relationships. And that, I would say, is justification enough to do this. 
provided we are also giving reasonable acknowledgement that, that some people don't want to live these lives. So, but I, yeah, I appreciate that is a, a line I have to, I have to try and uh, argue. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can I add just one little thing? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I, 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 I'm sympathetic to the to the argument, um, but the second idea I forgot. I had a note, but I had a lot of notes, so I, I forgot about this part. Um, the second idea is how can um, as, let's assume as as as, as uh, I think you are arguing that having valuable personal relationships. Uh, is good, allows you in a way to uh, have more options, more autonomy, more primary goods. Okay, but how can this be a matter of duty imposed by legal sanctions or legally imposed duties? Does not the state by imposing a duty on you in a way uh, makes it less valuable, the relationship with others. I mean, it, it's not spontaneous. <coughs> duties, for example, duties of friendship cannot be legally imposed. Yeah. Why? Because there won't be friendship anymore if I'm doing it just because it, it is my duty. Yeah. So among, per, among two people, a couple, that decide to live together, once it is a matter of duty, maybe this deprives it of the value that it's supposed to have. Yeah. So it's not, the, it's not valuable anymore, so it doesn't provide you a true primary good because it's not spontaneous. Um, this, this is the diagnosis clear. Thank you. Yeah, no, a absolutely. And so that is a strong argument for refraining from certain kinds of regulation. And I mean... Typically in family law, I mean, Geordie and I were talking about this beforehand, the law tends to regulate the consequence of these relationships after they have ended, when they have broken down. And providing that, you know, basic standards are met during the routine, provided no one is treating one another in abhorrent ways, abusing one another, that there's generally a case for the law to kind of stay out of these relationships to protect a sphere of intimacy. Uh, John Eakler, the family law scholar, he talks about the, a privileged sphere. He says there should be some privileged sphere of intimacy where the state does not intrude, precisely to preserve spontaneity, intimacy. So there is clearly a balance to be struck here, and certainly I'm not, I'm not arguing that every moral duty that is owed by people within their relationship should be rendered legally enforceable. Absolutely not. I mean, my argument, the, the thrust of my argument would imply that certain moral duties should not be rendered enforceable precisely for the reason you say. Um, so the question then is, where does the law get involved in a way which is kind of promotive of, protective of these autonomy interests, and where does it need to restrain? And for that reason, it tends to be more the consequences of relationships when they have broken down. That's where the law has an interest in getting involved, and I say must do so. Um, but when the relationship is going on, providing it's meeting these basic standards of decent treatment, the law probably should stay out of it for precisely the reasons you suggest. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with your observation um, in general, I'd say. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, thank you for your question, Diego. Uh, there is also a question asked by Henry. Other people would like to take the floor after Henry, perhaps? Not for now. Henry, you have the floor. Very nice, Stalin, very nice paper. I really like it. Thank you. Uh, I would like to propose you two readings. Yeah. Uh, in a way, the thesis that you are sustaining is that the state could regulate personal relationships as an instrument of developed autonomy. In this reconstruction, personal relationships have an instrumental value. But if this is the case, how we should know that we seek autonomy as an end that is value with a, a perfectionist view? That's one question. Mm. And the other one is another reconstruction, because in, in another way, personal relationships, you are saying to us, are primary goods and therefore have intrinsic, intrinsic value. Surely not every personal relationship with intrinsic value uh, should be regulated by the state. You know? So how we should know which kind of personal relationships with intrinsic value should be regulated by the state and which ones are not. You know? 
Uh, one way to establish this difference is with, uh, without taking a perfectionist view is with consequentialist view. Mm. So what, uh, uh, how you think about that and you will say yes to this or what you say to this? Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, as, as you say, I'm, um, my interest in personal relationships is in a sense instrumental because I'm not wanting to say, this goes back to the, the, the discussion we just had, I'm not wanting to commit my normative argument to the idea that these relationships are of intrinsic value. I mean, of course, I believe that certain relationships are of intrinsic value, but because I am anti-perfectionist, I do not want to use that as a justification for promoting certain relationships. So for that reason, um, I focus on these primary goods because they are, it shows how these relationships are instrumentally valuable. So that's an important consequence of my anti-perfectionist stance. Um, and, so, and so for the same reason, um, I distinguish myself from some uh, kind of perfectionist liberals who, like uh, Joseph Raz, who focus on the, uh, the sort of intrinsic value of an autonomous life. For me, my concept of autonomy I'm evoking here is quite a thin one, very much a Rawlsian one, um, simply based on the idea that to the extent that a person has a capacity to form a view, that creates a legitimate interest in a person determining their own life. But I don't have any particular end in view about what that life should be. So unlike Raz, who says autonomous lives are the best kinds of lives, which means lives in which people are able to kind of step aside from their commitments and evaluate them. I'm not necessarily saying that at all. Um, so, so yes, so th there is a point about how I'm trying to treat these goods as instrumental. Now, I think, I think the concern perhaps you're raising is that am I not therefore going back to a kind of consequentialist view? Um, so the way I am trying to avoid that is by saying we do have to invoke some concept of moral responsibility, moral desert, and so my, my example of the case at the end, the communal couple, I say this wealthier partner has a moral duty to assist um, the less wealthy partner, um, which derives from the way they've conducted their relationship. That's non-consequentialist insofar as the consequentialist view isn't interested in those questions of moral responsibility. It's simply saying we can use these people as means to the ends of the state. So I try to kind of thread the needle between these things by finding a concept of moral responsibility which is not grounded in a perfectionist moral code, um, which therefore allows me to just instrumentalise people, avoid instrumentalising people in the, in the consequentialist way. Um, now, whether I'm successful in doing that, yeah, but that, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, now, the, the, I think the other point, you saying, yeah, certain relationships are of significant value, intrinsic value, um, and we certainly don't think they should be regulated, and kind of the classic case is a kind of friendship, and if we go to kind of Aristotelian conceptions of friendship, his idea is that a true friendship is one in which people don't make these claims on one another because it's the nature of the friendship that they are motivated to do things just for the good of the other person, right? Um, and so if we want to preserve the possibility of those true friendships, then we should not regulate them in any way at all. Um, and I think that's fine, and there are certain relationships in which that's fine. The, the difficulty, of course, is if, if people do have a kind of true friendship, but then they do become involved in economic interdependence with one another, then there are going to be economic consequences to their relationship, which I don't think we can, we can just draw, we can just... Um, Overlook. So I think this comes back to the question of does a lack of regulation kind of promote autonomy, promote the ability of people to realise these goods, or does a lack of regulation actually hinder it? I would say if we are, um, if the lack of regulation jeopardises people's ability to conduct these relationships or imposes burdens on them for doing so, then a concern for autonomy requires us to engage in regulation. But if a friendship doesn't have any of those adverse consequences when it ends, because people are just motivated to do what they do for one another, um, they don't become kind of interdependent in any of these other economic ways. It's purely one of emotional interdependence. Now, I'd say very clearly a concern for autonomy and the development of these goods uh, suggests that there should be no legal regulation. So, I mean, dealing with, it, yeah, applying my argument to each of these individual relationships requires more argument than I give in my paper, but I, I'm trying to kind of set out a framework for thinking about how do we draw the distinctions between those relationships that do and those that do not require regulation. 
and I try and do it without either being perfectionist or consequentialist. So there's a lot of balls in the air I'm trying to find my way through. Right, nice. Yeah, thank no, thank you. This is actually the point. Trying to provide this framework to yeah. analyze the situations and then provide a, an answer instead of, let's say, institutionalizing ex ante uh, from, a point, mm -hmm. from a perfectionist point of view. That, that, that's the whole point of this exercise, and this is the importance of the exercise and also the importance of uh, uh, defining correctly this constraint of autonomy. Yeah. Because unless the conditions for autonomy are met or uh, unless autonomy is th thought in a way which promotes its primary goods, there is no autonomy. Yeah. So the, the, the argument based exclusively in this vision of autonomy, which is um, uh, 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 let me alone, uh, I have no, I bear no responsibility towards anyone, that, that's, that's not a possible concept, concept of autonomy. That, that's the whole point of the exercise. Thank you very much. Please, proceed. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a, a, a question. You talk a lot about the right kinds of relationships. Yeah. So I think there's some kind of commitment. My, my question is just if your argument about the importance of relationships could be used to, for the state to accept new, new ways of families. Because relationships are a good way of having these goods. Mm. So how we determine which kind of family relationship should be regulated or not, because with your argument we should maybe allow families with more than two members or other kind of new, I don't know, uh, autonomous, uh, selective kind of relationships. So that's my question. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, that's a huge, a huge part of why I started trying to think about this in this kind of very general and abstract way is so often in family law and in these normative debates, we kind of begin from the idea that the central examples of family relationships are marriage and parenthood, right? And parenthood is often understood in a very kind of traditional way in which the parents are genetically related to the child, the mother has given birth to the child, the father is genetically related to the child. And that, those are kind of the central cases and then, the, and then much normative debate says, okay, which other relationships are sufficiently similar to those ones that we can regulate them. And so much in the de facto relationships debate is about whether these de facto relationships are sufficiently similar to marital relationships. Now, the problem with that, there's two problems with that. Firstly, there's a lot of legal scholarship, political scholarship, uh, which questions the very idea of legal recognition of marriage. So Claire Chambers in Cambridge, um, her book Against Marriage, she presents a political liberal argument to say that people should be free to get married, but marriages shouldn't have legal implications attached to them at all. Now, if we, if we are at all attracted to that argument, or even if we believe it's a plausible possibility, we shouldn't begin by assuming that marriage is the central case, right? So part of what I want to do is avoid that initial commitment. The second thing, and I think lots of... Um, there's lots of scholarship uh, among sort of um, feminist scholars and also among um, sort of gay and lesbian legal scholars who really object to the idea of using marriage, traditional marriage, as this example. That the idea that we should measure relationships uh, about their similarity to this traditional example because there are other ways of conducting relationships which are perfectly legitimate, perfectly valuable, and crucially for me, can realise these goods. And so even if they are dissimilar from traditional marital relationships in various ways, that doesn't mean that they cannot be sources of these goods. Um, similarly, I think this bears on the question of who should be recognised as the, the, the parent or of having parental responsibility for the child. Because what matters is who stands in the kind of relationship to the child which is realising these goods for the child. It doesn't particularly matter if they're genetically related or if they're the biological parent. They could be the social parent. So... I'm trying to find a different set of grounds for identifying the sorts of relationships that should be treated as a basis for legal consequences that specifically gets away from a prior commitment to yeah, this traditional conception of what family law does. So absolutely, I mean, I, I, that's, that's a to totally a key point of what I'm trying to do, so thank you. Thank you very much. More questions? More? Anyone else <coughs> online? Any one of the participants online? Please proceed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Can you listen? Sorry, can you listen online to this participant? 
Yes? Okay. Go ahead. I'm a kind of outsider about this topic. So my question is a, a external question. It's about have you thought of the discussion about legal and moral responsibility in cases of omission to use the, the as a tool of just justification of what you want to say? Because one of the topics about omission in legal and in moral responsibility is the pre previous conduct of the person who has the duty to uh, act in some way. So in the cases of a, a, um, a family, uh, when there is a kind of relationship, we can assume you can maybe justify the, the grounding of a legal duty saying that this person has actually uh, previous, have actually acted in, in, in manners that they generate a kind of expect, expectation about how the uh, law should um, Yeah, no, I mean, so I haven't looked at that particular literature, but I can see, I can see a clear connection. Um, I think... So it, yeah, the, I, I am I am not familiar an insider to your field at all. So I may be saying things which are totally wrong. But um, I think often in family law, one of the things is there is often a problem when we try to apply uh, kind of non-family law remedies to family situations, precisely because the circumstances that must be met to give rise to that remedy are less likely to be met within a family law context. And so it may be we can stretch that other area of law to kind of in include a family context, but often that's difficult to do. So the examples I think of in, so for example, in the United States, many of these non-marital relationships are regulated using contra contract law principles and the idea of implicit contracts. But there's difficulty with that because, you know, in order to maintain the integrity of contract law, there need to be certain requirements on what is required for a valid contract to exist. And because the way people are conducting their relationships in their personal life, they are unlikely to you know, conduct their relationship in a way which satisfies those contracts. So we either have to stretch contract law to cover the family situation, which kind of threatens its integrity, or we have to leave some cases of the family situation without sufficient remedy. Um, but I guess the principles underlying, I suppose your point, the kind of the principles underlying this idea of circumstances which give rise to a duty, yeah, I can totally see there is a connection to what I'm saying, because really I'm saying it's, yeah, it's, it's a course of conduct that they have pursued which then creates this moral duty, which I say should be upheld as a legal duty. Um, but a practically, a, a difficult question for, for lawyers when we're actually trying to implement this idea is how do we kind of capture those relationships which have given rise to the duty and exclude relationships which haven't? Um, and this is why I think family lawyers are often attached to this idea that there should be a status, a status of a cohabiting relationship or a marital relationship or a de facto relationship. And it's the, the rights and duties come with the status rather than looking at the specific course of conduct. So, the course of conduct justifies us in creating the status, but when we then kind of come to implement it, we don't look so much at the course of conduct, we look at the status itself, if that makes sense. I realise that's a slightly mangled expression. But I mean, I can certainly see, yeah, I can certainly see there are a lot of overlaps with different areas of law here, um, certainly in the normative level. Then, the, when you look at the kind of doctrinal level of how this works in practice, it gets trickier, but certainly the normative core, I think there must be connections, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you much for such an inspiring uh, paper and talk. Thank you. I really enjoy it. Um, looking at the example of the communal couple mm -hmm. for justifying state intrusion on personal relationships, um, I wonder if the justification could be based on um, the justification for state intrusion could be based on investments. Uh, care, provision of care, and cohabitation. 
what do you think about these three uh, pillars? Uh, I'm thinking uh, in cases such as burden, mm -hmm. the burden siblings. Yeah. Why in this case uh, the protection uh, attached to the family was not granted yeah. to them? Yeah. And I'm also thinking uh, in other horizontal relationships beyond the uh, norm, such as uh, unions of more of two people, not mm -hmm. necessarily polyamorous unions, but uh, other unions who live together, who take care of them, yeah. uh, who make investments. Mm. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so certainly I think caring relationships, for example, are a key example of, you know, part of what a caring relationship is, at least as I understand the kind of literature on this, is that it is a commitment to take another person's needs as a motivation for action. I think that's um, sort of the way Kitte explains it. Um, and so by doing that, one is necessarily kind of um, yeah, what I call manifesting the sense, expanded sense of self, right? Treating other person's interests and motivation for one's own actions. And that is what helps to realise these particular goods. It allows you to be particularly attuned to the other person. It allows you to help meet their needs in an appropriate way. Um, and it's also what disadvantages you in, in if the relationship comes to an end or um, you know because you are putting your own interests aside for the good of the other person so certainly caring relationships um, would be a key example and kind of Elizabeth Brake um, who I kind of cite in the paper quite a bit her real focus is on caring relationships as the ground for entitlement um, so I, I certainly agree with that I, I also want to expand it beyond um, because I think for example the communal couple depending on how you understand what care is um, you could argue, I mean, you could question whether there is a relationship of care there. I mean, for some people, seem to understand care as involving a necessary dependency. So one person must be essentially dependent upon the other for there to be a caring relationship. You could question whether there is dependency in the communal couple because they're both, you know, they're both benefiting from this relationship in some sense. Um, so I would want care to be an element of what I'm saying, but I want to go beyond it. I mean, so the example of kind of investments. Um, certainly makes sense. Um, I suppose that the devil would be in the detail of how we spell that out because part of what I want to avoid is, you know, the when people participate in these close relationships, they don't necessarily see themselves as making a kind of an investment that will have a return. It's kind of obviously a fairly kind of economic way of looking at it. Um, and so what I worry about when we come to implement it is, you know, if we say, well, what was, was the expectation you would get this back by doing, you know, doing this thing for this person and you would get this back? Well, of, often in these relationships, people don't think in those ways at all. So there's certainly a sense in which there is an investment into the relationship and we want it to pay off for this person. But on the other sense, I wouldn't want there, us to be committed to the other. People have to conceive of themselves as doing that because I think in these close relationships, these really valuable relationships, People don't necessarily do that, um, you know. I, you know, my interactions with my son, I don't see them as investments that will pay off for me, and my interaction with my wife, I don't see that as as investments for the future. They just we do them because this is this is how we structure our lives. This is what matters to us. Um, but um, but clearly, we have to yeah, we have to find a way to kind of um, take these abstract ideas and make them sufficiently concrete that a court uh, could enforce these ideas. So. Um, so yeah, certainly things like investment, certainly yeah, concept of care, I think can be useful to us if they're used carefully. Um, the, the other point about you know um, relationships with more than one person, um, yeah, I mean absolutely. The, 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 I think the principles I'm trying to develop wouldn't wouldn't exclude relationships. So yeah, a caring relationship in which two siblings take care of an elderly parent, for example, there's no reason why that should be excluded from consideration. Obviously, there are legal complexities in how you implement a scheme like that. Um, but my, the principles I'm developing, I think, could support such a scheme, certainly. And yeah, on the example of the Burden sisters, um, so I don't, I don't know, some people may not know, but this was a case uh, which came out of England and Wales and uh, went to the European Court of Human Rights as two sisters who were kind of elderly spinsters, but they had lived together in a house and they had uh, basically cared for each other their entire lives. And they were objecting to the fact that they were ineligible to register their relationship under the Civil Partnership Act and therefore obtain the kind of relief from inheritance tax that they would otherwise obtain. Um, now, the, the reasoning of the European Court of Human Rights in object, rejecting their claim seemed to me entirely circular because it says, well, they don't get this because they haven't 
registered their relationship, <laughs> so, um, which, which was entirely circular. I mean, I think, yeah, the, the arguments I'm making could justify some kind of um, special entitlement for them um, because they participate in the right kind of relationship. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think certainly it can go beyond these kind of conjugal, intimate relationships and to a much wider class of relationships, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so I, I was just wondering, um, a bit related to what you just commented, uh, if if you understand that uh, all well, person, close personal relationships are a source for these primary goods, don't you think if you have a wide definition of dependency that there's always dependency on them? If, I mean, if they are a natural source for people to gain access to these primary goods. I would understand that this establishes some kind of dependency among the members of the core relationship. And this makes me wonder if you... I didn't have the opportunity to read your paper. Uh, so I, no, I, I, so I don't know if you address this. Um, but in the identification of this relationship, which has already come up, because sometimes these relationships, I think because of this dependency in nature, uh, are a source of abuse and are a source of the denial of these primary goods at the same time. Yeah. So do you deal with this? I mean, I don't know. Do you deal with this or what's your opinion? Or? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, yeah, certainly on a wide enough understanding of dependency, um, yeah, we, we can say these, these relationships are certainly emotionally interdependent, right? Um, so we can say that. Um, I suppose the issue I would want to be careful of is um, I wouldn't say that every, every situation of dependency necessarily entailed. So if someone is dependent on me, that doesn't in itself entail that I have a special duty towards them because people can be depend, you know, can, can render themselves dependent on other people in ways that are unfair or unreasonable. And so um, in the kind of ethic of care literature, there's some really interesting discussion of this. Um, so uh, Robin West uh, writes about this and uh, Kitto writes about this. Um, there can be unjust relationships of care where one person is overburdened by caring responsibilities to the other. So the example I always think of, if, if someone walked into this room now and handed me a tiny baby and then left, right? I would clearly have some moral duties to care for that baby. I couldn't just leave it on the table and walk out, right? Because that has been thrust upon me. But at the same time, there's clearly a situation of unfairness, of injustice, right? Because if I suddenly, my life is taken over by having to care for this baby that's just been thrust upon me, then there is unfairness. I can legitimately complain to the person who's left the baby with me. So the child is dependent on me, absolutely, um, but we have to question whether that in itself is sufficient to... Um, mean that I have to give over all, all these portions of my life, you know. Um, so, for that reason, I am wary of extending the concept of dependency too widely. So, I mean, Martha Feynman, for example, had, you know, gives a very broad concept of dependency. And, of course, in a sense, what she says is absolutely true. She says everyone is dependent because at any time anyone is at risk of injury because we are embodied human beings. And, and so, of course, what she says is true. My, my worry is that how how much we can use that as a normative foundation because if dependency is our normative foundation and we're all dependent on each other then there seems to be no end to the obligations we have so going back to your point yes there is emotional independence but whether it's sorry, interdependence but um, there's a tricky question about the, the, the point at which that creates a normative responsibility um, but um, yeah, and, and there's a question, and a separate question about whether they, that should be legally rendered legally enforceable. Um, no, it's usually the, inter the emotional interdependency that makes people in this relationship uh, to make certain choices or to. Yeah. No? So maybe, the, maybe yeah, dependency should be taken into account in that respect. Not as much as a normative a foundation for the recognition, but maybe I don't know to throw some, throw some light onto. Yeah. Onto the unfairness, uh, thing or... Yeah, yeah, and I suppose certainly in the way I address the kind of communal couple example, that you know they, they have made the decisions they have made because they participate in this kind of emotionally interdependent relationship. So, I would certainly want to incorporate it in that way, um, and and yeah, and and the the other point I think you made is that yeah, 
because of this emotional interdependence, there can be situations in which people can use these relationships to really harm one another in these unique ways. And that's certainly where, going back to the point about the protective response, that's why we need tailored schemes of regulation to tackle these particular uh, forms of abusive behaviour because it's very difficult to tackle them yeah, with the sort of criminal law that would apply between strangers because it's all about patterns of behaviour, it's all about the intimate relationship and it is about that dependency um, which renders it possible for people to mistreat people in that way. So certainly that has to be a factor, yeah, yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Roger? Thanks for your presentation. At the end of your presentation, you mentioned that the state owes uh, a remedy to, to people in front of this moral obligation. No? Do you think that the state can just say, okay, we are giving enough protection by recognizing ordinary actions such as inflicting of damages, unjust enrichment, etc.? Or is it really necessary to recognize certain categories to classify people? in relationships, and if, it's, if this is the case, we are maybe at the risk of excluding other types of relationships that may also um, deserve protection before these cases. What do you think that this uh, justification that giving ordinary actions would be suffice in this case, or we need to classify relationships? Yeah, okay, so... If the kind of law and doctrine of a particular jurisdiction was such that there were remedies that would cover all these cases, like unjust enrichment or um, you know, principles of trusts law or principles of contract law, then my objection falls away. Okay, So th there is a kind of doctrinal question about whether those remedies are available. But the issue is that if these duties... Uh, these moral duties, which I say need recognition in the law, if they are arising from the way people have conducted their particular personal relationships, then I think it's always going to be difficult for the general law to provide an appropriate remedy. And we see this kind of, I mean, I'm most familiar with the law of England and Wales, um, where the state has tried to respond to the circumstances of cohabiting couples, sorry, the courts have, by expanding principles of property law and trusts law. And so create, you know, developing the concept of a constructive trust by saying that there must be a joint intention to share in the property and so on. But the problem is, in order to retain the coherence of that area of trust law, there have to be some restrictions on you know, criteria that must be met before a person can show there was this common intention to share the property. Um, and that's always a difficulty because you have situations where people, they can't satisfy those duties. And so the law can stretch itself further and further to deal with situations in which, um, you know, people don't seem to have such a clear intention. And then we can extend the trust's remedy to deal with their situation. But the problem is then we lose the coherence of that aspect of the law. And eventually we kind of shade into what I'm arguing for anyway, which was saying, well, it's just the fact that they participated in this kind of relationship that allows us to give them this remedy under trust law, similarly for unjust enrichment. Well, what makes this kind of a, situ a circumstance of unjust enrichment? Well, if ultimately we say it's because it occurred in this kind of personal relationship, then effectively we are doing what I'm arguing for. We're grounding the entitlement in the personal relationship. If, on the other hand, we're saying it's not the relationship itself, but it's the fact that they pursued some particular course of conduct, that's fine, but then there will be other relationships in, that don't meet the criteria for that course of conduct, which then don't get a remedy. So I guess the kind of family law solution to this is to say it's the relationship itself that we need to focus as providing the ground for the entitlement rather than any other specific, uh, meeting specific other criteria. Um, but um, yeah, that, that, again, that is a kind of a doctrinal empirical question of where a particular jurisdiction may be able to resolve all these issues under what it calls its contract law. But I would probably say if it is able to resolve all these issues under its contract law, I'd say its contract law is really just incorporating the sort of principles I'm suggesting anyway. Um, but the, I think the second point you made is like if, if we're attaching them to status, then our, is there a risk we exclude some relationships from the status and then they don't get the remedy because our status is drawn too narrowly? And yeah, I mean, that is a, obviously a very challenging point of implementation because we want to draw these statuses sufficiently narrowly that we're not capturing people we shouldn't. Um, but at the same time, we want them broad enough to capture everyone we should. I, I think it's, an, it's a practical impossibility that we can capture everyone. I mean, if we have 
if we also have remedies of unjust en enrichment and uh, perhaps implied contracts or um, remedies under trust law, then you're providing potential backups for people who might need them. But I suppose, I mean, I think, is it George Eliot? She said, every rule is a pity for someone. So, you know, I think there's a fundamental question of implementation, which is probably unresolvable. We, it's very unlikely we're ever going to be able to capture every situation. Um, I mean, in English law, the way that people respond to this, because this is the English tradition, is to say, well, we just give judges loads of discretion so they can decide it all for themselves and they can respond to the details of the case. That has all sorts of other disadvantages, which I know from my time in practicing family law can be very, very bad as well. So those are problems which I think apply quite generally. They're not necessarily specific to my project. Um, but, I mean, yeah, they can't be dismissed and they are questions. I suppose I would try and excuse myself from worrying too much about it, saying I'm dealing with these abstract normative questions, questions of implementation, very important, but I, I leave those to other people because <laughs> by inclination I'm a philosopher rather than, <laughs> rather than a lawyer. But, yeah, they are very important points and they are not ones that are easily resolved, certainly. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Please, Diego. would have a question too. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, so I'm an outsider too, and, but I have a question related with your argument. It's like an internal question. And it's this, I wonder whether your, uh, your argument, your justification is not kind of uh, self-reinforcing okay. in this way. Uh, you claim, if, if I understand you, uh, you claim that the grounding uh, of the legal entitlement of the right kind of personal relationships is justified because these personal relationships, particularly these ones, increase people's primary goods and self-respect uh, self and psycho-emotional judgment in particular. But my guess is that this happens, the increasing of these personal uh, primary goods, happens because people, in part, Thinks that these are desirable relationships. These particular relationships are desirable, and I wonder if the fact that these relationships are thinking as desirable by people is not uh, caused by the fact that the law is entitled these particular relationships. So, if this is the case, if legal entitlement has a causal. Uh, is counsel responsible of the fact that people believe that these relationships are desirable? So it's, it's a circular argument, mm. at least in part. I, I'm not saying that, uh, that the desirability of the relationships because what people think is, is the only thing that makes self-respect uh, increase or something like that. But in part, I think that is a, a self-reinforcing argument. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not... No, no, I, I totally understand your argument. So I guess if I'm understanding right, I think perhaps the situation, we see this perhaps with marriage, right? So marriage, particularly in Western societies, is, is very aspirational. So, you know, some scholars say one of the reasons why we see people getting married later in life and we see more non-marital cohabitation is because marriage has gone from something you just have to do as a moral requirement to an aspiration People want to wait until they are, you know, they feel they deserve marriage. Um, and so I think certainly, and you know, when we looked at arguments in favour of gay marriage, a huge part of that was people felt that they would, by being excluded from this institution, it was the state showing a level of disrespect to them and their relationships. And so I'm sure you're right that because the law endorses certain relationships, it kind of says you are entitled to feel this sense of self-esteem and self-respect by being married and it attaches some significance to marriage. So I certainly wouldn't deny that that is an aspect. Um, I guess I would say that that can only be one part of why close relationships have the effects they do. And I would say not necessarily a kind of one that I would want to strongly promote because the problem is if we're saying that you know, marriages are deserving of special esteem because the state wants to recognise those relationships as particularly important or particularly valuable, then that is necessarily kind of an exclusionary to people who actually find their relationships, which are not non-marital, to be sources of important self-respect and esteem for them. 
So, and, and this kind of links to Claire Chambers, who I mentioned before. Her argument against the state recognition of marriage is, is very much along these lines, which is that it's the state saying these relationships should be treated as particularly valuable. People should feel a sense of self-respect because they are married and should feel kind of less respect for themselves because they're not. And she says that's not something the state should be doing. So I guess I don't want to deny at all your point, which is that the legal recognition of relationships in some sense implies a state endorsement of them. But for me, that's an argument to say we need a different basis on which we recognise relationships. We need to expand the range of relationships that are recognised. Um, and I guess, I, I, I suppose I would say another point on that is the, the importance that people attach to marriage, I suppose you could question how much that is to do with its specific legal implications and whether that's more a social phenomenon. So I think as many family lawyers and family scholars know, many people who get married really have a very vague understanding of the legal implications of getting married. And I know this from my time in practice. People come to me and say, oh, it's okay, I know I have to do this, this and this, and I'm happy to do that. And I have to say, actually, that's not what the law says you have to do. I think many people, when they get married, what they feel they are buying into is a kind of social institution, which actually often has very little reflection in the law. So, for example, most people who get married think that that implies a commitment to monogamy, right? But there's no, in, certainly in England and Wales, there's no legal duty to be monogamous when you marry. Um, particularly when we have no-fault divorce now, it's not even a grounds for, ground for divorce that someone commits adultery. So one of the main social significances that people attach to marriage has no reflection in the law. So I, I, I would question the extent to which the legal accoutrements of these relationships are significant in increasing self-respect. I feel that's more kind of a social phenomenon but I would say, even if it's not, I would say there are still important sources. You know, these relationships are important sources of self-respect, regardless of how they are legally reflected. Um, but I, I do acknowledge the point you make. I, I, I think there is a risk of circularity in the argument if, if I develop it in a certain way, but I guess I would resist the idea that it's inherently circular. But I mean, certainly, yeah. If I was saying the state should recognise these relationships because that implies endorsement and that itself is a source of self-respect, well, we could use that to justify it. recognition of any relationship, right? Um, <laughs> so I wouldn't want to go down that line. But yeah, I, I do, I acknowledge the point. There is a point to be wary of there. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Anyone else, perhaps online? Want to raise any other questions? No one? Well, I, I would like to, to perhaps mm, uh, finish a little bit uh, the, the, this presentation by pointing to, to the, the whole uh, goal of the exercise and connecting as well with my comments regarding the... Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I, want, I wanted to connect with my uh, initial comment regarding the, 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 the situation in which uh, the regulation of the de facto couples uh, 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 is, is today here in Catalonia. No? And uh, this, the, the whole goal of this exercise that you have proposed us is to try to find, a, as you mentioned, this general justification of the specific uh, burdening or privileging of certain kinds of relationships. Yeah. And that is a question of, uh, actually, of definition of family law. What is family law? And whether family law represents uh, a specific way of addressing certain problems in society. Uh, and in this way, I also say, would like to say that family law, as it is also your point, does not mean strictly only the entitlements that we have amongst each other the so-called members of the families, but how these uh, uh, personal relationships are treated by the state and by the society as a whole. And this, you have uh, skipped the example of immigration rules, but we live with this everywhere. Because, uh, as you pointed, this definition of family, this who, 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 who's a family, that is not only a, a, a precondition for several entitlements in private law, let's say, but also and many, many, perhaps one might say more important as well for most of us, uh, entitlements in the area of social law, public law, and whatever. But we cannot stick to a division, a, a summa division between public law and, and, and private law in this matter. I would say on the contrary, because your approach is deliberately uh, 
uh, uh, um, addressing this division in a way that is entitlements in a way of entitlements of recognition and uh, uh, triggering uh, legal consequences. I think that this uh, um, goal of finding a general justification of the burdens placed to individuals by specific relationships that exist in society is a far-reaching um, approach for our discussion regarding how this re particular regulation on the fact of couples is, is grounded or not. I had, at the very beginning, I, I, I challenged the view of the Spanish Constitutional Court, simply dismissing any kind of statutory regulation of the de facto couples by saying that this is against the autonomy of the persons. After this seminar, I think most of us, if not all, should be clear that the con this concept of autonomy is, a re is reductive and does not provide any answer. It simply dismisses the claim of this uh, part of the society and appeals to a sort of neutrality of the state, which is simply false. The state is not neutral. The state provides, as you mentioned, the framework of any kind of relationships and certain entitlements are possible and certain consequences, certain courses of action are possible because the state is organizing the society in this way. Yeah. So uh, when the Constitutional Court in Spain and the Ordinary Court in Spain following the path uh, set by the Constitutional Court are simply claiming that uh, parties are free uh, to enter or not enter into a relationship and that they must commit themselves in a way which is express and formal and uh, only within certain specific parameters, this denies this moral duty of this person and this contradicts the very responsibility that the state has as regards the uh, legal regulation of these uh, uh, relationships. And I would say that from this, from this point of view, it is certain that the case law of the Constitutional Court is wrong. In addition, I would say, and there, are, there have been several comments in the intervention, that the possibility of leaving the regulation to contract law, to unjust enrichment claims, to other kinds of uh, general remedies, also contradicts the very essence of this type of relationships. And everywhere we have seen now, focusing on positive law, I would say, in Spain, for instance, recourse to uh, having uh, the possibility of a remedy based on property law has been denied repeatedly. Remedies uh, uh, regarding the possibility of applying by analogy family law provisions uh, for marriage couples have been denied repeatedly. So all doors has been, have been closed, and there has not been even an essay to try to make this approach. So this guy, these people are left, are left to an uh, abstentionist state who is uh, uh, waving up its responsibility towards this kind of uh, persons in society. So I think that ending that, thank you very much, Matt, because you have opened us some avenues of thinking that will help certainly us to try to counter some views that are, are extended in our society, but I think that they are based on assumptions that are not terrible from this more um, creative and constructive view of autonomy and uh, that, that need to be, to be uh, 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 um, stressed and highlighted. Thank you very much, and thank you all of you for following this seminar, and please uh, give an applause to Matt for his...